a little bit about myself beyond the blurb here. So my grad and undergrad is in computer science. I should write code. Uh, and then moved to the business side, went to Kellogg, got the MBA and all of that. So that's where my background is. Since then, I've moved into the business side of things, primarily marketing. And I spent eight years at SAP before I did Loran. My thinking is very enterprisey. That's what I think about. I don't think consumer at all. I think enterprise application, that's a footprint I typically look and consider. So my talk today primarily will be around. We can't hear. Yeah. Sorry. So my talk today, is it better? Yeah. Okay. So my talk today will primarily be around enterprise application through the enterprise lens, i.e. what would businesses do and get value from blockchain? It's a small group, so what I'll do is I'll try to make the presentation a little short, leave more time for Q&A. If I'm going too fast, let me know. If I'm going too slow, let me know as well. So let's do a quick you know, pulse check, right? On a scale of one to five, five being you're really aware of blockchain, and one mean you're a newbie. How many people are three plus? That's good. Fairly, fairly good. How many people are focused on enterprise versus consumer? Let's say enterprise. Okay. Ironically, people who are blockchain who put their hands up seem to be more consumer. That's probably true. Okay. So if you ask an average person, if you mention blockchain, the first reaction is what? Is Bitcoin, right? That's obvious because blockchain's best manifestation today is indeed Bitcoin. It's a very powerful manifestation. It's a really intelligent, powerful manifestation. And the challenge therefore is how do we get beyond the obvious shiny object, which is Bitcoin. So that's what I'll talk about today, how we looked at the problem, how we're building a company around that, and what problem are we trying to solve here, all through an enterprise lens. So this is a tongue-in-cheek slide. So what will blockchain do? It'll solve world hunger. It'll also solve cure cancer. Right? That's what people say, blockchain will do everything. It'll one day eliminate wars as well. But you know, I'm not going to talk about any of those. I'm going to put a very simple thing. I'm going to talk about how it'll change enterprise applications. It's a very simple topic compared to all the other complex topics that we could solve. Now, what does it really mean, though, right? What does enterprise applications mean? What I mean by that is something very simple. How can a business derive value from blockchain? for the data, for the processes, for the supply chain, all of that, right? A lot of things can be done. So I'll focus on a very specific example that I am looking at today with, with LOAC. You know, let's go a little deeper. Why is blockchain important, right? Of course, it's a very compelling piece of tech, no question. What does it mean? Of course, it's decentralized. We know that. Of course, it is immutable. We know that. Of course, it's secure. We know that. So there's some really foundational elements that are, cannot be replicated that easily. That's a given, right? The challenge is how do you apply those building blocks to a real business use case? And that's where the trick is. That's where the interesting part comes in. But blockchain is not interesting just for the fact that it's a really powerful piece of tech. Of course, it's great. It's also important because it's brought in the notion of tokenization, which means an asset can be divvied up. A physical asset, a service, or software asset, which couldn't be done before. So you can take an asset, break it up, i.e. tokenize it. That notion changes things a lot if you think it through. The fact it's in a DL or a ledger is not interesting. It's interesting, of course, but the fact you can tokenize is very even more important. And that's what a lot of companies are trying to solve. In terms of how can you take tokenization, how do you take centralization or decentralization and change that whole modality of thinking. The third aspect is that because it's tokenized, you have a new way of raising capital for companies, which wasn't there three years back. Three years back, you're starting a company, the value or whatever, you have basically three choices. Go to an angel investor, go to a series A, series B, or go private equity. 
That's pretty much what you have. Tokenization brought in a completely new aspect of raising capital. So today, a lot of companies do ICOs and IEOs, right? Where they put a token out, you can go and buy it. Now, is it equity? It's not. Is it dividend? It's not. Is it profit sharing? It's not. But it's a new way of raising capital. So that's a very powerful construct for raising capital to build a company. So you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to raise capital. You could be in Taiwan, in Shanghai, wherever. It does not really matter. So that is a very powerful concept. And these three things coming together is what makes blockchain even more interesting. Now, we look at blockchain a lot, obviously, and we said, let's try to put it into a framework to see how can you parse the underlying aspects of blockchain, right? Of course, the obvious aspect we all talk about is it centralized or decentralized. That's one dimension, right? The second is, are we focused on value, i.e. currency, or data? And this is the classic thing that people talk about when you say blockchain is decentralized. We'll take the central party out. We'll cut the middleman out. Right? That's obvious. And they typically focus on value, which is money, transaction costs, whatever. What we said is there's a lot more to it than this aspect. So the first wave of innovation came here. 90% innovation has been here, trying to decentralize using currency or other assets as the first line of defense. What we are trying to do is to look at it from this perspective, look at enterprise data. Forget currency. We don't care. We care, but we don't care with the product. In, an, in a business use case, is centralization important? It is very important. Are they going to give it up? Probably not. So let's not fight that battle. Let's not force a company to decentralize. They, that's not how they behave. That's not how they operate. So let's build up application stack that understands and acknowledges that centralization is a reality. It will not change in the short term, but they value enterprise data. That's their golden nugget. So how can you bring those two pieces together? That's what I'll kind of talk about as we go along. Of course, there will be a lot of interesting aspects coming here as well and here as well. We happen to focus there. Now, what we at Loya can bring it back together, right? We said, what is the most important asset of an enterprise or a business? We said it's data. The data is what matters to any enterprise. Billions are spent trying to protect the data, firewalls, networking software, a lot of that. We put a moat around our enterprise. So we know that signal is there. They're going to spend money, tons of money, trying to protect the data, right? Now, we spoke to many, many, many CIOs and, and, and CXOs across the globe. Here's some examples I'm giving you. SAP tells us, hey, listen, we, want, we share a lot of data with our customers and partners every day. But once the data leaves a firewall, we are blind. We don't know. And we need to share the data. It's a requirement for our business. We can't operate in, in a silo. So they do that. Can they track it? No, they can't. Let's take Zurich, the largest insurance company on the planet. Same problem. The data they share is different. It's more policy data, risk profile, whatever that might be. The same fundamental problem. And so on and so forth, right? I was talking to Ericsson in, in Singapore. Ericsson pulls data from Singtel's network to analyze. How's the network doing? All of that. Singtel says, hey, who are you sharing the data with? Because it's got confidential consumer data. By law, we can't share that. Today, the only way they can control is by legal contracts. It gives the name, name of people who have access to it. That's the only way they can do it, because there's no other way. And Nissan works with about 180 design partners on their cars designing automotive driving, car parts, LiDAR, a bunch of stuff. And today they use FTP, which is a file transfer protocol to share data. So CIO is telling us, hey, I just want to be able to track my data. I want a visual dashboard of my data that goes outside the company. That's the example. And all of them have a common theme. My data, I care about it. I still own it. 
I'm choosing to share it, but I don't know where the data is going. So this is not to say that data will never leak. It will definitely leak. But at least you have a torch that you can shine on the problem now. You know where your data is going. That's a first line of defense. It's like saying, let's put a camera outside a front door. Does that mean no one will come and break a front door? Probably not. They may still try. But at least you are shining a light. You know who has the data, who is coming into your door. That's where you look at the problem. Now, any enterprise today shares a lot of data with a whole set of partners because they never build or sell alone. If you're Nissan, you have design partners, manufacturing partners. If you're Zurich, you have other channel partners, so on and so forth. Therefore, you don't have control over the data, which means that the risk to you is significant. This is data that's been put out by Gartner and other people, right? You lose data, huge cost, huge cost in the global economy. And there are disputes. My version of the truth versus your version of the truth, because you're a partner. There's no unified way of looking at it. So that's a big problem. Number three, if you take GDPR, which is the EU compliance director, if customer says, forget me, take my data out, if you fail, the fines are substantial. Why do companies fail in complying with GDPR? Because they don't know where the data, data is. That's a real cost. So the impact could be significant. So, and if you go a little deeper, a little bit technical, but I'll do this anyway. Why is this a problem, right? The problem is because it's a multi-tiered problem. One, data cuts across company boundaries. Your firewall, your partner firewall, it happens. Number two, data goes between clouds, your on-premise clouds, your application clouds, your private and public clouds. That's how it is, that's the reality. You can't change the reality. It's going to happen anyway. So the question is, how then do you give people the ability to track the data given this environment that's a reality? Trying to change this ain't going to happen. No chance. So let's figure out a way to enable this while giving the benefit that will help them cut costs, increase revenue, and remove risk. This is a very complex problem. Let's not kid ourselves. It's a very complex problem because there are ingrained enterprise applications People behave a certain way. Email is still used. People send data on WhatsApp too, for that matter. They do it. You can't change it, but let's start to take the first step towards changing the way people think of data. It's funny, right? If you want to send me a, a document to Palo Alto, California today, you call FedEx. FedEx comes, picks it up. You know the driver picked it up because you get a text on it, a notification on it. You know it went to the van, you know it went to a plane. You know it landed in San Francisco. Can you do that with your data? You cannot. It's very ironical. Old school, we can do it. For a data, we can't do it. That's a simple way to look at the problem. Now, what we are trying to do is build a, put a blockchain fabric that cuts across company boundaries. And said, if you share data using an enterprise application, then we will be able to track where the data is going to approve users within the network. It's not a public blockchain, though. That will not work, because companies today are still very, very cagey about putting data onto a public blockchain. So this is a permission private blockchain that will allow people to create. For example, Diva here, right, as an example, again, could create their own network for their partners. And people are permission into the network. Similarly, SAP can do that. Mercedes-Benz can do that, right? That's the way we kind of look at the world. If you do this, what happens is auditability comes in. We're able to track your data. Number two, it's a single source of truth now. There's no he said, she said anymore, hopefully. Always be there, but we actually can minimize it a whole lot. And number three, you can tie obligations with smart contracts as well, based on data. So that's the way we've been looking at uh, the notion of blockchain transforming enterprises. Now, we did something a little different than most companies. We said the LOAC token is a data token. It doesn't hold any value that's currency related. It holds data. Means 
the data that's in the token is protected. Who is the owner? Who are the granting privileges to? And what has been done with it? That's what our notion of tokenization is coming to play. And the thinking is, is done over a blockchain fabric, no question. But we added a lot of context around that. The reason is companies don't think of data in a vacuum. Data is business context that comes from CRM, from ERP. So you've got to pull aligned data with the business context. Only then it makes sense. Otherwise, you're a file sharing platform. It's, it's not very useful. You still go back to the old ways of doing it. So think of data as being the anchor and around which is a lot of business context that comes from existing applications that we will pull in and integrate and, 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 and enable the transcoding and propagation of that. Enterprises are still very wary of using blockchain. Most projects today, 99% are still in the POC stage. That's the reality. Could, there's still a lot of nuance around it. There's some legal issues around it, a lot of complexity around that. So most of the effort today is around POCs. We're gonna do a trial, we're gonna do a proof of concept, which is fine, which is how it's going to happen in the short term. Ironically, there's a lot of budget and innovation that's being approved for POCs. We want to test it out, kick the tires. That's how we have been seeing consistently across the board. We are seeing more customers trying stuff in EU than in North America, which is very, very rare around blockchain. Latin America too, a lot of stuff is happening. US, unlike everything else, is a little bit behind on the blockchain curve. Variety of reasons. Historical VC funding, blah, 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 right? Because the SEC is not quite sure on where the tokens lie on the equity scale. So there's a lot of noise around that. China is doing a lot, though they banned a bunch of the companies. A lot of stuff happening on the fabric side, platform side in China as well. Now, if you had the LOAC platform or any other, right, what could happen? This is an example that we demo to a customer, right? Is that if you're ZT, which is a big handset manufacturer in China, right? Mm -hmm. Their concern was that, hey, someone is telling us that we share data with the country that is under embargo. They said, we didn't. Another government says, you did. So right now, as he said, she said, there's no way to navigate that disconnect. If we had a platform like this one or any other, you could be able to say, listen, I know my data went to these subsidiaries, channel partners, resellers, blah, 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 blah. I know this is how the data has been flowing. I know it went to a design partner in San Francisco. It went to their office number one, office number two, and three people, four people saw it. This doesn't mean that you know, office number two could have done something bad with it. They, may still have, they still can, but the point is now they can stay with authority that office number two, four people saw it and accessed it. That's a level of transparency we're trying to bring to blockchain. Now, here's the interesting part, right? Data today sits within internal clouds, meaning internal data center, sits within Box and Dropbox. It sits on my and someone else's laptop. You can't change the reality. Data in motion will stay, I'm sorry, data in rest will stay with data in rest, where data is resting, we can't change that. When data is moving is when we come in. It's like, you know, in the olden times we had a fort, right? They would build forts to protect your town or whatever. And you would put a moat around it, you would put guards around it. That's what we do today. We will put firewalls around our enterprise. We do a good job with that because we spend billions of dollars doing that. The moment the more the, the fort door opens, the horse leaves, we don't know what's going to happen. It's gone. We are saying that that is what we want to solve. Let's give the horse rider who's carrying valuable information the visibility both from the fort and outside so we can track where he is going. Now, I've been often asked, right, is that how big is this market? And there are a lot of numbers out there, right? From a business perspective. Because today, enterprises are still a little cagey. 
Gartner says the blockchain broader ecosystem will generate around $176 billion in revenue for the next four years. That's a big number, right? I don't know how they come up with it. They have some explanation, but it doesn't compute to me. But let's go with that for now, right? Within that, they say the enterprise data stack is around probably $9.6 billion. So that's what we are focused on as a target market for us. Now, the, the reality is that, as I was saying before, and adoption is very varied across the globe, which means for a startup or a young company, go to market is very tricky because you can't put a lot of resource into the US because adoption is still slow. You, you use a lot better. Zurich is doing a lot of cool stuff around blockchain. So is Mercedes-Benz, so is BMW. So for us as a company, it's very interesting to kind of go where the market is and hopefully hoping that the US will come along and adopt as quickly as we want them to. Second notion is pricing. How do you price an enterprise blockchain product? Do tokens have a role? Because they're no interest in currency uh, uh, notions at all. They don't care. They will not pay in Bitcoin. They'll pay in old currency, but only use the platform. So think of us as a SaaS product, software as a service product, which is just being used, which happens to protect data using blockchain. So when we sell, we don't even mention blockchain. Because we only mention blockchain, red, yellow, green flags go up, both good and bad. So we mention blockchain, it gives you all of that, then move on. Because blockchain is plumbing, end of the day. Right? That's not the trick. Is. The trick is what can you put around that that adds value. And I was talking to a very interesting customer, a prospect actually, they're not a customer yet. And he says, hey, I, this is great, but what if this person takes a picture of the document and sends it across on their phone? Can we protect it? We can't protect it. No one can. Does it mean you don't even do this? You don't, right? That's a dilemma. I, I, this is why I say, do you, you know it's, you're going to be hacked, so you do not spend on firewall? You know, you don't leave the front door open. You try to close it. So those angles will still be there. So we more, focus more on transparency and tracking as opposed to full end-to-end -end encapsulation of data. Now, data is a loaded word in enterprise. Documents, of course, this video files, audio files, a bunch of other stuff. And we are data agnostic. We don't care what the data is. It doesn't matter to us. Number two, you can't put a lot of data into blockchain. I'm sure you guys know this. Blockchain is a ledger. It is not meant to hold a lot of data because the data is replicated. So you've got to be very thoughtful about it. Does all data go into the blockchain? No. In our case, a pointer goes into the blockchain. The data resides off-chain in a private zone. That's how we're solving the transaction speed problem. Otherwise, it will not, it'll not really be practical. That's the way we looked at it. I'm sharing this anecdote just to kind of showcase the complexity around this topic, despite it being so obvious. It's not obvious. It's, not, it's very, very complex. Now, we had a, a, another customer who said, that they had do business in the EU. And EU has something called GDPR, which is a big compliance director. This customer's customer say, hey, listen, I'm going with another vendor, right? So don't send me emails. Another vendor, take my name off your list. The customer says, of course, we can do it. They go, take the name of all the marketing lists, no more emails to the customer, old customer. A month later, the customer gets another email. Hey, please attend our webinar or something like that. So customers say, hey, what is this? I told you to take my name off. Oh, wait, take it off again. They did some stuff, take it off. It happens again. They get sued for a big check because of the violation. The problem was that the data was sitting in a marketing platform outside their firewall. It was shared. They have no line of sight. So that's the problem that we want to solve. It's a very complex problem, and it's a board level escalation. It's not a typical you know, a IT cell or a CIO cell. It's a little bit broader than that. And there's another interesting case where this company is a security company, ironically. They do security, the largest cloud security company on the planet. When, let's say you have a bank as a customer. The bank calls, hey, listen, I see something in my firewall. 
can you put me to support? So support takes the call. Support says, oh yeah, happy to help. Can you send me your firewall logs? They need it to solve the problem. Of course, so they send the firewall logs over. The customer rep puts it onto Box, which is the Box storage, puts it onto his or her laptop, and then realizes it's a complex problem. I need second level support, which is serviced by a third party partner, like Cisco, because of the network problem. What do they do? They send the data, go to Cisco. So the bank comes and says, listen, I want to do an audit where my data is. Can they do an audit? They cannot, because the tools don't exist. Data is here and there. I've sent it over by email. So it came from email, went onto machines, shared by a box, then went by email outside the company. This again is a huge issue because it's a lawsuit kind of reality because the customer has compliance issues on the sharing data. And now I've done that, and you've done something else with it, I have no way of solving that problem. So as you can see, it's a, it's a, it's a hairy problem. It's a complex problem. It's not an easy one to solve, which is why we are hoping you're trying to solve it. We have patterns that we filed and all of that. The, the interesting part is one of the patterns we filed is the notion that blockchain today is a very linear structure. You think linear. One block, 10 blocks, million blocks replicated across, right? That's the reason it's very heavy. That's the reason why transaction speeds are so low. We said, let's do a tree structure blockchain. Blockchain that's a nested structure. There's a mother, a mother node and there are tree nodes. And they share some data, but not all data, which means the mother node has a lot more data. The tree nodes don't have all the data. Therefore, you can reduce the footprint for the blockchain significantly. That's one thing we're trying to do as well. It's a complex problem again, but that's the way we're looking at it. So this is a summary of what we're trying to do. Now, if you look at the enterprise needs broadly, let's spend a minute there, right? We happen to focus on data as a problem. The whole, there are many other problems to solve. The classic one is supply chain. Everyone talks about it. Why? Because the data is coming, or the physical asset is coming, I want to track it. That's an obvious one, right? Supply chain, I need transparency, I need auditability, I need to make sure it's authentic, blah, blah, blah. So that's an easy one. We didn't focus on that because supply chain introduces a lot of hardware complexity. How do you track an asset? You need an IoT to track it. That's the only signature you have. So that's there as well. Now, I like what Ripple is doing on the bank-to-bank -bank side. Swift is an old protocol for intra-bank transfer. They said we're going to use, solve it using blockchain. Some success, some failure, but broadly going the right direction, right? Very good example of that. Then we have another company doing something interesting called, we're going to do Dropbox and blockchain. What does it mean? It means your data is secure. Your Dropbox is hacked, your data will not go, will be able to protect your data. Some, I think, will live on long, some I don't know where they'll go, because concept sounds right to me, but will people use it, pay for the money to put my data on a blockchain? I really don't know. So we'll figure it out as we go along. The another one, which is really interesting that I personally like, is a company helping to track refugees, uniform, universal ID on blockchain because that's a problem. Refugees don't have IDs. They go through the system across countries. It's a huge problem. So how can you give them a unique identifier to an audience that is not tech savvy? So they're doing some really interesting work there to really track that notion of a person on a blockchain. Easy for a government to do it. Government says, I want to do blockchain. Your ID is in blockchain. Well, it's on blockchain. But for someone who's nationless or stateless but needs the ID itself, how can they do that? It's a very cool innovation that's happening there as well. So there are quite a few more, but I think th this is good enough. So this is what I want to talk about broadly. And this is how we look at the application stack, right? There's a lot of innovation happening at the infrastructure side in blockchain. AWS doing stuff, Dropbox doing a bunch of stuff, right? Make the infrastructure a lot more scalable. The platform is where the innovation has been happening a whole lot new platforms are coming out for blockchain, many of them, right? And you know all of them, right? And so it typically has stayed here thus far. We said we're going to ignore all of this. We don't care. We're not good at this. We're going to focus here. 
On this layer, we look at it in a very simple manner. For any enterprise, there are three systems of applications broadly. Transaction systems, the ERP and so forth, right? Very hardcore transactions. Then there are systems that are systems of record, analytics, all of that, right? We hold data, we hold records. Then systems that help you engage, email system, community systems, texting system, all of that. What we said is we're going to build a system of trust on top of these applications for enterprises. Trust meaning known entities sharing data with permission, but with visibility and tracking. That's the way we looked at the world of the enterprise stack. Now, the system of trust means something, which means that we can't go to a customer and say, listen, use our platform, let go of everything you have. It won't happen. They have a legacy. They spent billions of dollars into applications, right? From Oracle, from SAP, and God knows what. So what we are saying is, keep that what you have for data at rest, use this for data in motion when data moves. And we focus primarily on partner engagement first, your data shared with partners, because that's an easy one to solve. They care about it, they need to do it. Over time, the plans could evolve and extend. We have a plan for what it means down the line. But for the short term, the plan is to help secure and trace, trace data as it goes beyond the firewall. Now, there's a lot of work coming. Uh, actually, for example, Facebook is going to announce, it's already been announced, a pretty compelling initiative called Libra on blockchain. That is probably the most compelling broad-based effort that anyone has done from the enterprise side to really you know, make blockchain current code mass beyond Bitcoin all of that, right? Which is pretty interesting. The interesting part is the people involved in this effort are MasterCard, the poster child for centralization, right? Uber, it's a lot, lot of it, but the point is they're doing something. I'm sure other people will follow as well. And then MasterCard is doing a bunch of stuff as around that as well, because they see this as a way to enable really new transaction models that were not possible thus far. Because across industry, across uh, countries, microtransactions, a bunch of stuff. They're doing some really cool stuff there as well. So I don't buy the fact that you can take a central operator out that easily. This centralization and decentralization is, is, sounds great. It actually makes a lot of sense. But that will not happen in the short term. So the toll taker, i.e. the central party, is providing some value. And they're motivated to keep providing that value, whether they you agree the value is good or not. They are not going to let go of their incumbent positions. There'll be a lot of pushback, right? That's what we see happening. Ripple was the first effort where they did something to change the status quo for bank-to-bank -bank, uh, interactions. It's probably the only one, actually, that's made some effort at the application layer. In fact, the market cap is bigger than the Ethereum market cap right now. It tells you a story right there. That the platform value is there, the platform value will be subsumed by the application stack going forward, because the application where the data is, where the value is, where the transactions happen. So that's what I wanted to kind of share uh, at a high level. So what I'll do now is I'll probably have gone, I think, into my time. I'll stop now and then open the floor for q a it's informal to stop me ask questions i may not know the answer for 90 percent of what you ask me but i'll try to answer and we'll debate some please okay quick, quick question on the previous example with the chart uh, i'm not sure i'm not number five so you're gonna have to excuse my ignorance on, on it but basically i think on blockchain and bitcoin one of the issue was the double spending to prevent the double spending in, in in the case of this system does the data can the data does it stay in the system that is it while transferring to other or it's sorted in the fact that data is at one point specifically and cannot be duplicated so the data so what we did yes thank you we separated out data from the context, meaning the data sits in one common repository. The metadata, i.e. who and the what, moves along. The data is still in one place. To so the fact that you so got it's, it. It's basically the access that can be transferred from one to the other. Correct. Access, privilege, and rights can be translated or not. And you, you, you have ruling on it, who can have it. Correct. So the owner of the data 
puts a ruling on that. And they can revoke it as well. So it's real time, it can be revoked. If you can't revoke it, it's meaningless because if the parties compromise, you have a problem. That's how we looked at solving it. I'm sure the other ways, but that's the perspective we took. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so you said in the, in the beginning that one of the key benefits of blockchain is a decentralization, but that enterprises will not let go of that centralization. So, I mean, maybe it's a very simplistic question, but what is then the application of blockchain in the enterprise if there is no decentralization? And if you break down blockchain, right? Centralized and decentralization is just one aspect of blockchain i.e. where is it and who is controlling that access, right, if you will. But immutability, security, single source of record are other attributes which can exist without centralization or with. So that's what we focus on, meaning if you tell SAP as an example, you put it down to, onto a public blockchain, you have no control. <clears throat> to them, in today's world, that's a big leap of faith. It's our data. We need to know where it's going, right? Sure. That's a perspective. So the point is that dimension of blockchain is less interesting to them as compared to other dimensions. That's what I'm trying to say. And it'll change over time. It's like cloud. 10 years back, I don't want to put my data into public cloud. Everyone did that. And today, <coughs> it's in public cloud, right? It's OK. So I think it's just a evolutionary path, and it'll change, and it has to change. OK, but let's say, I mean, again, a really simplistic, because I'm, I'm, I'm not super familiar with blockchain at all, but you know, we're, we're at Google now. You, know, you have Google Drive. I can share a document and set very granular permissions for everybody in my value chain, my network, my partners. Um, so my understanding from you is that if you were to do this on blockchain, that the security would be more robust, it would be less. I don't know, hackable, or, or would that be the correct way to, to think of it? Yes, and also the context is Google Drive or any other, think of it from a file perspective. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, lot of business context around the file that is missing or that moves in other systems now. So you send a link, hey, John, look at this, blah, 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 this is what we discussed. And here's a link to Google Drive. So you decouple the context from the content. That's because we think about files, because Google Drive, Dropbox, came from a file sharing perspective, we've got to break that model. System needs to be contextual enough to grab data from unstructured data, like an email, like <clears throat> system, or a CRM system, or an ERP system. So as we say the business context is important. Data is one aspect of the business context. So it's almost like saying, think of what Google Drive could be if it had all the context together. Otherwise, you're still sharing files, right? You can get to probably 80%, 10%, whatever, but it's still very clunky. My question is a follow-up on this decentralization. Now, a lot of companies like um, Microsoft and uh, Goldman, JP Morgan, all have their blockchain program, plus now Facebook. I mean, while we were moving, from bank to bank, now banks have to subscribe to the blockchain program of JP and Goldman. So I kind of feel from moving from centralization to decentralization, we are actually moving to sort of like monopoly. Uh, maybe I'm being a little cynical, but uh, isn't it against the point of blockchain? You're right. From, from a puritanical perspective, as someone who's very thinks pure blockchain, that's right. But then Ripple is a decentralized centralized. It's actually centralized. Ripple is the mothership, is, is, a, is actually the core. So the point is, which is what I keep saying, decentralization, decentralization is a good dialogue, but that's not the only value of blockchain. Enterprise for the next few years will still argue around, hey, my data, my chain, your chain, your, and that's what's going to happen. Which means, can cross chains collaborate? Probably yes. It's a, I have to move that way because, see, JP Morgan has two objectives, broadly simplifying, right? One is we don't want to be disintermediated. Can we own it by creating our own chain? That's one objective. The second is can we generate new source of revenue if we had our own chain? That's a simplistic way to look at it. That's what they're looking at, I'm sure, as well. 
Does it mean they're going to give up their power today? Hell no. In fact, when the CEO of JP Morgan was kind of you know, downplaying and, and bad-mouthing Bitcoin, and I'm sorry, Bitcoin and blockchain, they were investing significantly into blockchain. That's how it is. That's the reality. In fact, there's also rumor, I don't know how true it is, is that the two biggest owners, uh, enterprise owners of Bitcoin are Google and Goldman Sachs. Who knows, right? Um, so there's reality to some reality to that. They're not going to give up their power in a hurry. No one is going to do that. Having said that, if there's value in, in JP Morgan providing a service, then people will adopt that. It's simple as that, right? No one is doing it for altruistic reasons. I'd like to go back to your uh, pointer comment between the link between the metadata and the off off chain data. The off chain data is not traveling along, right? Or it's not tacked onto the blockchain. Correct. And there's a pointer. Correct. To the data. And Correct. the data is on IPFS. Okay. Residing where? In within the data center of your host company, or in a public chain. How we want to do it? It's if your Mercedes Benz. This IPFS private cloud could host this data store. While the metadata or the tracking Met travels along. Exactly right. OK. Second question relative to this. Uh, have you received any questions from you put up uh, SAP, Ericsson, Nissan about the relationship security wise and tamper wise between the pointer, the data, and the metadata? No, actually, yes, it does. It does come up, right? OK. And that's the fun foundational piece of what we're trying to solve. We've got to be able to show that the metadata, one, cannot be fractured, number one, right? The shell cannot be fractured. Number two, you can revoke it if it is fractured. Number three, it'll do what it's supposed to do. And that's exactly what we are trying to solve as well. And we have the notion of a pixel. A file can have a pixel, which gives a signal, right? Like, you know, old system. So the pixel will tell us. The data has been changed or not, the file has been changed or not. So that's the apply principle we're applying to tokens as well. If we don't solve that, which is what we're doing now, the whole model won't work. So you, be, you need to be able to show that metadata, which is not token, is moving around with full protection that cannot be tampered with. And that's that's not tough to do. The problem is to have all, all the pieces work together. Because in an ideal world, you'll have Hey, I'm going to send over 10,000 pieces of data this month into my network for one company. Someone will send a million over. And these things cannot obviously overlap, though they're in the same chain. It's a zone, right? So that's the difficult part. And to an end user, they should not even know blockchain or care about blockchain. I drag and drop stuff. Things happen. That's the tough part for us to solve, for anyone to solve, to so, mask the complexity. So to what capacity have you demoed this? So this is done. We have version one out that we're working with uh, early adopter customers with. Some of the ones here, not all of them. And right now, it's mostly in the POC state because companies are very skeptical about putting a lot of stuff onto it. So we're doing POCs, and they are scaling out from group to department to enterprise. A lot of people don't want to talk about it in public because it shines a light. They think it's innovative, blah, 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 blah. So it's definitely happening. Uh, any company that is in, has compliance is going to be slow to adopt. Because obviously fin financial services, not going to do it easily because government issues. But, but do you agree that the stress test, to, not to the technology, but the application, is the volume? This is the real stress test. If Nissan is going to send data, they're Correct. not going to send bits and pieces of data. Correct. They're going to send enormous amounts of data. Correct. And they're going to ride on the chain in terms of the metadata, the pointers pointing everywhere, changing zones, potentially changing security zones in terms of where the cages go compliance-wise. Does it go into EU, goes into Switzerland, gets out of Switzerland? So the stress test is in the volume. The transaction volume is not a problem for us because it's a private chain. right? The transaction volume becomes a big issue when it's a public chain. In this case, it's a narrow. In, 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 any company will probably be one one fifth of a public chain in terms of transaction volume because it's not that much, right? So that, too, for us, volume is not a problem. That we can solve, and we've solved that. 
The issue is trying all these pieces together. The data, the pointers, the zones, the zones go in and out, different countries. That's the part, because companies do send data across the world in different form, as you mentioned. So today, what we're trying to say is, guys, let's do it contained for a set of partners in a region sharing a kind of data. Start small, right? And the biggest example we've seen are manufacturing partners, because the company can say, Nissan can say, listen, I want you all to use it. If you're a partner of Nissan, if you're a manufacturing partner, you have no choice. You use it, right? Because Nissan says so. But if SAP says, my channel partners, if you want to sell SAP product, you've got to use it, well, you've got to use it. So where this, this notion of centralization, ironically, is where the adoption will come first, which is totally antithesis to the philosophy of blockchain. But that's how we're seeing. And we're not pushing that badly. We don't want to say, go do it everywhere. No, no, that won't work anyway, right? It just won't. Just curious because you mentioned Ripple, etc. So uh, take uh, Musk; they used it for supply chain. There's a clear use case. There's a clear, um, you know, savings. There's a clear in terms of inventory, etc. ABN Amro, ING, they're going with Ethereum. There's a clear, you know, faster payments, etc. For your business proposition, it's it's just my, the enterprises need to avoid a possible loss of data and avoid a possible uh, you know, legal case. How do you convince, just curious behind the scenes, how do you convince the board to make an investment because there's no clear ROI in this case? That's question one. Question two, uh, from a layman's perspective, I've heard, you start off with tokenization. I've heard football players are being tokenized. I read in the newspapers a couple of weeks back, there was a community in South Africa where the whites came across something with blockchain so that the water can be used within that community. I just can't understand how that works. If you could explain, it would be fantastic. Yeah, two interesting but diametrically, diametrically opposite questions, right? On the first part, we all know this. What sells? Fear or greed. That's all it is, right? So in our case, it's fear. This is insurance. That's what we focus on. Because if you don't have this, you will get you know a 4% global revenue fine from GDPR EU, you lose data, you lose revenue. That's what we focus on. And that message seems to run, which is, by the way, the message for all security companies by and large. If I don't get hacked, is it because, because I had the firewall? If I didn't have it, would I get hacked? I don't know. Right? So that's the message we fit. And so that seems to resonate very because easily. They have to both in the firewall company and in you. So the question is, you're right. Firewall is intra, we are inter. Intra company was inter company, right? Over time, this has to somehow fit together, right? And we'll see how that plays out, right? For now, we say we're intra, we're not firewall, bio firewall stuff anyway. That's the best way we can fight that battle. Going back to the second very interesting question is that, I've seen this too, by the way. If you have a laundromat, can you tokenize a laundromat? Right? I, I have a laundromat sitting in Uganda somewhere. Hey, you invest in it, and every time it's a coin, you get a percentage of that. That's essentially what tokenization is, right? The fact that I can now monetize an asset or a service, which goes to what you're saying. If I'm a football player or whomever, or soccer player, or football player, uh, can I monetize something of my value in a way use, using tokens, right? That's the thing. You know, I think that is right now, it's all in the fluffy area. It's, nothing's been proven right now. The concept makes sense. Not in any example that really does it well. That's just reality. Will that stop you from trying? Hell no. They should try. You should all try, right? But I haven't seen anything of meaningful. For example, someone approached us about five months back and said, listen, I have a whole collection of very valuable paintings. They're worth tens of millions of dollars, worth half a billion dollars, whatever. Can you help us tokenize it? That's not our business at all. But he's saying, you know, I want to, his idea is, I want people to buy, people to buy a percentage of my painting because the value goes up, they'll get something. So his asset is in his, in his bedroom or wherever. He wants people to buy into that and helping them monetize if the value goes up. First of all, who knows what the painting is worth? Second of all, who's going to track the appreciation and then do that? 
all kinds of crazy ideas, tough to really say what's going to work. So we are picking something that's much more understand within our zone and what we can understand and what we can perhaps deliver and make money. We are not a charity, so we are not doing it altruistically. We're trying to make money out of that. I am just following on from the last question. I'm still a bit confused because if you're saying the main value is about, you know, it's fear and greed and people are scared of losing data, but at the same time, you've admitted that um, data is going to be able to go uh, through a picture of something or, or through copy and paste, whatever. I mean, you're not actually protecting anything. I can see this kind of works. You gave the analogy of tracking very interesting for companies to see how, where their data is going overall, the flow of it, the network, you can draw nice maps and you could also do something with like the authenticity of the data, you can stamp it or somehow, and that would be something very positive, which would be a little bit foolproof as well. But the this idea of protection, uh, it just doesn't seem to protect in the end. It's, it's tra tra tracking it and seeing who's using it, but it's, it's not safe. I think you're right. I'll give you an example. When Hollywood makes a movie, let's say they make Avengers, right? Endgame, they make a movie. There are probably 50 actors in it. You know what Hollywood does today? Each of us gets a different script. If you're all actors in the movie, each of us gets a different script. You don't know what's different from your script and my script, but they're different. So if it leaks, it will leak. It leaks often. They know where the leak came from. That's what they're trying to solve. Leak will always happen. The fact that they're saying, let's protect, bring the risk down, is how they look at it, right? To your point, transparency is a big aspect of what we sell. Number two, authenticity, clearly. Third thing is monetization. Once you know where data is going, you can monetize in new and different ways. That's the third angle that's going to come into play, right? Because today, if you're a gardener, take an example, the big research company. My data, my market research reports go everywhere. But if I were able to create a way and how I can monetize it, right, then it's interesting. Paper use, paper view, whatever. So that's the angle there. The other angle, you're right. People want to take a picture. We can't solve it today, right, and do it. But that, you're not even solving. And people know that, acknowledge that. Same notion of, can I, should I put a camera outside my front door or not? Well, I want a camera because I don't have nothing, right? That's the way we look at it. Hi, thank you. Have you worked with any regulated industries and had any conversations with regulators and what's their feedback on sharing sensitive data in regulated industries? Yeah, we haven't, we looked at it and chose to step back by design. We don't want to sell into FinTech companies right now, as an example, just because it's very nuanced across countries. What FINRA wants for insurance in in US is very different from what Zurich uh, compliance requirement wants here. What they want is obviously the same thing: transparency, governance, sharing, all of that. They haven't taken a position on how it impacts with blockchain, how blockchain impacts that. They have in theory. So we've chosen not to go into two big industries, fintech and medical, for obvious reasons, right? They're huge compliance issues very sensitive data, and there's so many other industries we can go after, which is much more easily manageable. So we've chosen not to, we had dialogues with many people, but we've just chosen not to market around that and sell around that, just a choice we made. So at the end of the day, you don't transfer the data, so it wouldn't be a problem. Sorry, at the end of the day, you don't transfer the data, so it wouldn't be a problem. So it's probably a big market in that sense. You're exactly right. The question for us is, do we have the company, do we take that on now yeah, or, or get later. adoption later? Yeah. And go, right? okay. You're exactly yeah. right. Because That's exactly a story. Hey, data is here in your firewall. It mm. doesn't move. But we've chosen not to go that way because it's a big enough market anyway. Mm. Thank you. Uh, one question regarding security. Because to what extent, uh, knowing that blockchain is a new technology, and we hear that sometimes, and in some cases, it's nothing is hundred percent safe. So at some point we heard, I mean, we read articles about uh, the the system having some flaws. No one knows, right? It's under development, uh, and probably that's why companies are taking the foot the first step to be in and testing the ground. 
uh, to your knowledge, how that is this evolving? Because uh, yeah. definitely they're going to talk about the, the advantages, but few people will talk about the flaws around the system. So because you have hands-on in it. So what's, what's your view on this? Yes, yeah, so the way we address that is by saying, guys, we are not a public chain. That's a first response. Which means we are not public chain in the sense that the chain is public, and we are, not public, uh, we are not public domain software. We are proprietary software, which means you can audit our software. You can come in and look at it and do whatever you want. right? That's the way we kind of address that problem. Having said that, had there been hacks into blockchain in the ecosystem, yes, but they've been not around the core platform itself. It's been more around exchanges losing money or people losing their wallets. Is the fabric has been fairly robust despite being relatively new. People have banged on it. People have tried a lot of stuff, but nothing really has formally happened. And kudos to the team that you know came up with this topic, right? Of course, there have been leaks in exchanges. People lost money. I, you know, some there's a story recently. This guy forget his, uh, his uh, uh, private key, lost hundred million dollars, and no one knows. It's gone forever. So that gets a lot of news, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. What about interoperability? Suppose if I am Nissan, my partner is using something like Loyak, then how do I transfer data between my company that I'm using and your company? Yes. So the notion of cross-chain, right? How do cross-chain start? That's a big topic. It's an important topic. What we do right now is saying, hey, we'll go to the anchor ship, the mothership, and have them dictate to their partners that they got to use the platform. So we don't sell to a small company you know, who's a design partner. We say, we'll sell to the big guys. Nissan say, hey, listen, you got to use my platform if you want to share data. That's it. So that's how we are getting around that problem. Over time, though, cross-chain will come up, and we'll work, we're working towards that. But that's not a priority for us right now, because it's a edge problem, as we call it. It'll happen, but later. Okay. I'm just curious, have you been approached by any healthcare companies or have you explored that? Yeah, yeah. so we're working with a couple, you know, Abbott Labs is one of them. And there's data that is related to research, R&D, pharma, that's one example. There's data related to patients, another example. Then data related to their ecosystem of partner, partners and doctors, third example. Drug data is very, very, uh, controlled and, and governed because when a drug trial happens, a lot of things happen. A little bit tricky to do, right? Patient data, even more complex. Every country has their own nuance around how can you protect your patient data. We tend to focus on their partner data. How do you send data to your physician network, your, your doctor network? Because that doesn't have as many regulations. It's a lot easier. It's easy to manage. Because example, let's say a drug comes out 10 years back. There's a new side effect to the drug. How do you communicate that with transparency to the whole doctor ecosystem across the globe? So that's the kind of thing we look at. Because that's a little bit more manageable, is very confined, and it's around the ecosystem, not core. Right? That's how we looked at it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so for the cross-chain uh, that you had mentioned, uh, do you see any specific industry to be facing such challenges? I mean, in the supply chain side, especially, uh, you referred to MERS, but one of the main challenges was the standardization of how the systems will be speaking or the chains will be speaking with each other. So in the future, which industry you expect that this thing will be going faster than the others? And will there be any kind of standardization problems in your view? Yeah, I think in the enterprise stack, right, supply chain clearly is a big one, right? No question about it. But the interesting part, though, let's say you're a supplier to, I don't know, Mercedes-Benz. You may also be a supplier to BMW. What happens is you may have to be cross-chain because BMW's chain is different or maybe the same as, as Mercedes-Benz. So the problem is not at the stage where the people paying the money have a problem. The people's their network has a problem. So people are solving this problem first before you get there. It'll come, right? So I think cross-chain is not, there are a lot of work going on there. And it seems to be not as complex a problem as we think it is from the first glance. Because if the fabric is coded to a certain standard, I mean, Ethereum or Hyperchain or, or whatever, right? I, um, 
then the cross chain can be harmonized. There are companies working around the common layer that abstracts the chain centric stuff. So I would say that it's still, no one is asking for a cross chain solution right now. It'll come, but the people are saying, hey, let's wait it out, let the demand come. Conceptually, it makes sense. We need it, but the demand is not going to pay you a check, write a check because cross chain is a need. Sorry, simple question. Uh, when you gave the example that Nissan will enforce their partners to use it, I'm just trying to visualize what does your platform or user interface look like? Whoa. That's a very interesting question. So in our platform, there is, we've spent a lot of time on the user experience. Yeah. Imagine a ERM application. It's called Enterprise Relationship Management Application. Yeah. Not CRM, not ERP, ERM. Bring up LOAC, you configure, my partners are these 100 partners. You make them nodes. Within each node, John, Steve, Kathy have access to it, right? Someone sets it up. Could be the business owner or could be the partner you allow them to do that. Then you essentially drag in and drop in. This is meant for Kathy and team, only meant to be shared by Kathy and team, or allow, allow Kathy to share within their company, i.e. these four nodes, or beyond that. That's how we think it's working. Okay, so the transaction of data, Correct. even though it's metadata, it's through your platform. It's through our platform. Okay. Exactly right. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. We have no control, right? Is it online? Yes. So our UX will be on iPhone, iPad, Android, desktop, because it doesn't matter. That's the easy part. The real secret sauce is what happened underneath the cover. So UI, we really don't care. So right now, we'll support all these four platforms. Uh, one question outside blockchain. Uh, more about your company. Uh, you said initially that uh, there has been less interest in US. Uh, how has been your experience in raising the funds and what's the stage like? Did you face a lot of difficulties or is it like you boot, sell, uh, bootstrapped your company? How's the experience so far? Yeah, so we invested on our own. Then we raised private angel money from London and Australia and the US, that's fine. So capital wasn't a problem for us is because we didn't have great needs. We had an existing business, we're gonna use that. And we have customers who are paying us money as well. One of our partners licensed the technology and did an ICO as well, out of London, not out of the US. If we had a partner, we licensed the tech to them and did an ICO. So that is going on as well. And we have some you know, agreement with them as to what that means. So we did not go out and try to raise a lot of money because for what we need right now, that wasn't the requirement. And we, we have customers today who are paying us, so that's how we evolved. So we kind of grew a little slowly. And by choice, because we didn't have the need. Yeah. <laughs> it's me again. Um, what is it inherently then, I guess maybe from a technical perspective, about blockchain, if you strip out the decentralization um, which is where I thought all of the um, inherent security came from. If you strip that out, what is it about blockchain that makes it such a good, um, that makes it so suited for, for these applications? So I think it's interesting, right? People used to say, why blockchain is a distributed ledger? It's a ledger that sits across multiple places. That's what it is, right? Oracle could say, listen, it's a ledger, a database that happens to be sitting across. I mean, that's essentially blockchain at some very basic level, but it goes beyond that. The fact that whether centralized or decentralized doesn't matter, the fact that no one person can change it without everyone agreeing is a very important aspect. So even if you hack into the ledger, decentralized, decentralized, decentralized doesn't matter. You can't change something because the network figures it out. That's very important. Aspect. Second aspect is even if you change it, it's immutable, meaning we know it's been changed by you forever. So that's a very powerful notion, right? And the third aspect is it's super secure, it's difficult to hack into, right? So all these aspects are very, very strong, very thoughtful. But can't you, I mean, I mean, databases or, or data stores today, you have all of these things as well, don't you? I mean. Yeah, yeah I mean, that, that's exactly what Oracle is claiming, right? Hey, this is no different from, this deal is no different than the other one. But the fact that the notion of, you know, think of the power of this, right? 
someone sitting in, in Shenzhen, China is approving a block that's going into the chain. Very powerful. You don't even know who that is. You don't need to know. The fact that the veracity of the chain is being managed by an unknown party using some mathematical formula is a very powerful notion. You're basically able to leverage the whole ecosystem without knowing them at all. That principle is very strong. And that you can't do. Can someone block, you know, come into a ledger that's owned by someone without knowing who you are? It doesn't happen. So that, that powerful notion of being able to participate in the ecosystem, do a task, get paid for it, and not and be, be mutable is super powerful, the powerful of that. Centralized decentralization is important, but I think to me, that's like the I keep saying, it's just 10% of the whole value at large. So in your example of Nissan, would Nissan then, you know, would they have then the infrastructure to ensure that the chain and all of the nodes in the chain or all of the blocks in the chain are actually being kept up to date, are actually being Correct. kept. That's what our same. platform will do. Nissan will not even think chain, okay. should not even know chain. They think nodes. That's all they care. My partner, A, B, C, and D. Under the covers, it happened to be on blockchain because it's a good tech to do all that. So that's how we mask the use, use case for them. Otherwise, it's too complex. You know, I pick up a phone, I call. I don't need to know there's a, a, a T1 line going underneath the covers. I don't care. I want to call, right? Similar notion. It just uh, seems to me a little bit ironic that, I mean, this sounds very, very powerful um, as a concept with the pointers traveling around. And it, But it, you said 10% of the value comes from decentralization. I mean, I can, I can see this has huge value decentralized, basically. Because imagine you have two companies. You talk about, like, it's a very 19th century company model here, big company, like chains of suppliers. We've lost all of this kind of... Uh, uh, new uh, new age of um, interconnectedness. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, what happens if you have a big company meets another big company and uh, we want to use, I want to use my system, now I want to use my system, and you're going to end up with middle, you basically said it yourself, you're going to have blockchain middleware, which is uh, platforms, which basically another. So middleware for blockchain just sounds like a kind of crazy idea because I thought we were getting away from that. That's all. I can see it could work uh, on a universal basis to share, instead of sharing the data, keeping it nice and safe, sharing the access rights and things. It's a lovely model, but it just seems too narrow to be. Uh, yeah, it's another version of enterprise software. See, it's interesting you say that, and it's probably true, right? The fact, you know, when you look at cloud, take cloud as an example, early on, I don't want to put my data into a public cloud. It's not secure. I don't know what it is. That's what everyone said. And now AWS is a gazillion billion dollar business, right? You are doing that. CIA puts data onto public into AWS. It's known as a public fact. So it's it's a continuum to you, right? Right? How it goes there. Eventually, we'll get to utopia, i.e., it's a public chain, it's decentralized. Pragmatically, I don't see it happening in the short term. It's just a recognition of reality. Companies don't behave that way. And they have to take baby steps. As long as we provide value that's aligned with their timeline, we win. We are too ahead. We don't. They don't care. They don't want it. Right? That's the dilemma that we all have. Build something the customer wants today and is willing to pay today. Sorry, I got a little bit confused because you kept on talking about nodes. If I summarize, it's a permission decentralized. Private chain. Correct. Okay, thanks. For the sake of the time, let's take uh, two more questions. Okay. So, um, my question is more, um, this one would be related to, uh, I mean, knowing the, the industry and the, 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 the solutions already there, um, and I'm sure you did your research, isn't it like some kind of the next era of uh, data management platform or enterprise content management platform is is some of the solution providers in that space are there seeing, because I, I see that as being their uh, natural development going forward. Are they doing the same or are they slower because what they are in terms of large corporation? Do you have any any insights on this? No, you're right. 
the ECM guys like you know Open Text and a bunch of other guys, right? Or the New Age guys like Box and Dropbox. They think of data as blind file objects. That's a thing. It makes sense. And ECM primarily today is used internally most of the time. Box is trying to change it, but used inside all the time, right? So will they move towards here? They probably should, but their baggage and install base is what typically happens. This take time for them to move. They'll figure out what the next path is because they, their customers are saying, hey, I don't want to touch this. This is what I'm used to. That's how innovation happens, right? The yeah. mothership. Yeah. The, so they will have to move. They will have to move. The big guys, the SAP Oracle will have to move too. Because just, I mean, just my two cents on this, because it's, it, uh, I did some uh, analogy with uh, uh, my, my, my last employer uh, work in the aerospace industry, and the aerospace industry has already cracked this uh, previously to uh, distribute their um, engineering designs across the supply chain, uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, and they, they, they use, but not based on blockchain, it's called PLM, so it's another technology. But I see, I see the the importance of that when it comes to data distribution and traceability uh, outside of the firewall. So, and yeah. you apply that same thinking to every enterprise, is how we looked at it, yeah. right? Why should only Boeing have it? Yeah. Everyone should have it. And today, it's not feasible. Boeing can afford, afford to put hundreds of million dollars to doing that because they build a platform, they can do custom stuff. They were able to distribute, but not trace. So yeah. they can give access to data. Which is a common, most common problem, but that, right? Matrix, Once it yes, leaves, exactly. it's gone. I don't know. Just taking on this question, trying to visualize how your application would look like. You said, so it sits on top of an ERP or an EPM or a CRM, is it? So that is an integration that has to happen with the application, and that's through APIs or microservices. Or what is it? So, yeah, in our use cases, we don't see ERP as much. I mentioned that. I'll see that happening. I don't see CRM as much. Actually, CRM more than ERP because deals are in CRM, not in ERP, right? So, the, our system is built on REST APIs. So, it's very easy to tie into any CRP, CRM system or ERP system. In the first phase, we have not seen too many ERP integrations at all. We've seen some CRM. That's how it is. And over time, ECM will come in, ERP will come in, CRM will come in, PLM will come in, all those things will come in as well. But for now, that's not been a big requirement. It's a new category that we're creating called ERM. That's how we're kind of going to market. The, the reason I asked is if someone is looking for an upgrade on the underlying application, naturally, that will add to the cost of Correct. the integration of a development or modification. Correct. And we're staying at the data layer, meaning the data, the data store doesn't change that often. So if you do that, then you're future-proof. If not, you have a problem. Thank you. OK, so uh, thank you so much, Salim. Thank you so much for an interesting talk. Thanks for your engagement. And thanks in Seattle for leading this. What we're trying to do is we want to make it regularly, monthly basis. But we also want to scale it to a lot of people. So please, please help us. When you get the invitation of the next Tech Talks, please share it with as many people as possible. We want to scale and grow our community. This is really important because this is, I mean, the, the more we, we increase our knowledge and the knowledge of all these kind of technologies is also important for us and for the community. So that this is really like an ask for all of us to make things uh, happen and grow uh, better. Again, thank you so much. And hopefully I see you again here in our office. Thank you. Thank you, Sarin. Yeah. 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 Yeah.